with the life cycle of the salmon before. Although it's a river-born fish, it grows big from sea living before returning to its river birthplace to spawn. Its character is evident right from the start, when it's a tiny fish in the river and is called a par. It descends to the sea as a smolt. Then it becomes a voracious and savage feeder upon all creatures smaller than itself, small fish, shrimps, Anything it can find. Look at its head. That's the head of a preying animal with large, rapacious jaws. But when it gets back into fresh water, it no longer preys. It loses the feeding urge, living on its fat until it's spawned. Yet, st still the character remains the same instinct to be fierce and voracious. We're coming back to the salmon this time to catch it by spinning for it. Now, in the simplest possible terms, spinning is casting out a bait, an artificial bait, or a natural one, and winding it back so that as it comes through the water, it suggests a living and to be preyed upon creature. A small fish, probably. There are all sorts of spinning baits you can use. Devon minnows, spoons, all sorts of things. A Devon minnow, as you see, is a very simple thing, just a tapered cylinder with two spinning veins at the head. Uh, but by spinning it suggests life. Each revolution in the water emits flash and vibration, which is picked up by the nervous system of the fish, uh, suggests something which might be attacked. As you can see, the mount slides easily out of the shell of the minnow, so that the shell can slide up the trace when the fish is hooked, leaving the hook in the fish's mouth. This is what happens when the fish is hooked. The shell slides up the trace, and the fish can't exert leverage on the shell to work the hook out. And here's a spoon. It works in much the same way. As it's drawn back through the water, the spoon revolves round the bar on which it's mounted, emitting flash and vibration, and so suggesting a living creature. Now, where shall we go for some spinning for salmon? Let's try the north of England up in the hills of the Lake District. The River Lewin in the rolling country of Westland is a beautiful salmon river. And unlike some rivers in which you can fish for salmon, it has the feeling all the time that salmon are there. You see them, often head and tailing at the surface. You feel that your fly, your bait, is, is fishing over salmon all the time. But when should fly be used, or when should you spin? Well, very broadly, spinning is used when the water is full and cold, usually early spring. As the water warms up, as it becomes rather thinner, less of it, you know, so it becomes more suitable for fly fishing. There are, of course, some who prefer spinning at all times, even in the warm water of summer, and those who must always fly fish, using sunk fly even in the heavy cold water of spring. The fisherman we're with today, trying for salmon, is Herbert Normington. He's a North Country expert who knows this river intimately and has caught a great many salmon from it. He judges the water and weather prospects first. It's fairly mild, a dull day in May with a downstream breeze. He's decided to spin. He's using a multiplying reel, it's geared, so that it can be narrow in diameter for ease of casting, yet recovers line quickly, because one turn of the handle makes a number of turns of the spool. The line he's using is braided terrelin, which has almost no stretch at all, on a ten-foot split cane rod. Like a fly rod, a spinning rod has a lot of action. Action which goes right down the rod, right down to the hand. 
The bait he'll use is controlled by the condition of the weather and the state of the water. The colder the water, the bigger the spinning bait must be to interest the deep-lying fish. When the water's warm, low and thin, the bait must be smaller and wound back faster. He's judged the conditions demand a Devon minnow, one about three inches long. In today's conditions of water, the slight weight of the Devon minnow would be insufficient to get down to where the fish are lying. So some lead must be used on the trace to get the bait down. The ball bearing swivel prevents kink, so when the bait spins, the spin doesn't pass up the line. Where Herbert Normington is going to fish is a typical River Loon pool. He knows the lies where salmon have been found before and therefore where others will be in the same position. Herbert's starting very near the top of the pool, the throat as it's called. He wets the trace to help sink the bait. He knows there's a salmon in the slack water near the top of the pool. He tends to cast more upstream than he normally would to allow for the breeze so that his cast arrives at the head of the pool and will swing downstream and across. The rod is held still as the current swings the bait downstream. Now he winds it slowly, three or four turns. It comes across in an arc, and he winds it more quickly now to bring it back to him. The aim should always be to let the salmon see the bait for a short time, once. He takes the same number of steps downstream each time before making the next cast. If he took less, there's a danger of the same salmon seeing the bait too often. If he took more, it could be that some salmon wouldn't see the bait at all. Bring the bait across and over where the salmon is waiting. Now the bait's on the way, travelling back. Winding faster on the recovery. No, still nothing doing. Move further downstream. Cast again, across and back. Spinning all the time. No, he hasn't taken. Herbert Nomington won't cast again for that fish. If there's one thing more certain than any other to make a fish not come again, is to cast again straight away. He's decided on a change of bait. Meanwhile, it gives that salmon, a couple of casts downstream, a chance to rest. The water's thinner than Herbert Normington thought, so he's going to try a minnow, rather smaller, rather darker coloured. From the top of the pool, again across to that lie. Over, and down with the current, speeding up the bait as it comes across. No, no results yet. Move downstream to that other lie, where a fish has just shown.
Well, out on the further side of the main current, just into the slack water and across into the current. And wind, spinning the bait back against the stream, trying to attract that salmon. And he's on. Swing the rod back to make sure the hooks are home. This pause after hooking is typical of salmon. And now he's off, running downstream. Herbert Normington's giving him line, waiting his opportunity to induce him to run up against the current. He must get it upstream against the current to tire it more quickly. He's gaining line now. The fish is beginning to tire. Now he's got him upstream. He's taking advantage of this to move down, to keep below the fish, encouraging it all the time to go upstream against the current. The fish is jigging, always a difficult thing with a salmon. When it doesn't run, it lashes about on the surface. Herbert Normington's still playing him from downstream and taking advantage to get him out of the current into the slack of water. Getting ready to back up the shingle, he draw him gently into the shallow water. Odd thing about salmon, when you've got them into the slack water and you hold the spool still, you can leave them like a dog. But it's not all over yet. Many a salmon's lost at this stage. Now he's bringing it in. There it is, threshing itself up on the shingle. And that's the end of the fight. And there it is, a splendid fish. A lovely loon salmon. Well, I hope you enjoyed that day's salmon fishing as much as I did. One day we'll go fly fishing for salmon. Now, that's a deeply fascinating form of fishing. Indeed, there are those who think that fly fishing is the only way to fish for salmon. Uh, but really, it's a matter of weather and water and time of the year. In the cold water of spring, there's no doubt that spinning is better. But as the water warms up and becomes thinner, less of it, you know, so fly fishing comes into its own. Well, perhaps we can try it together sometime. See you soon.
grayling is essentially a winter fish, and it only thrives in clear, unpolluted, streamy waters like the trout and salmon. In fact, it is a member of the salmon family. Its favourite waters are glides and streams on the edge of fast water in shoals, feeding on insect larvae, worms and small crustaceans. That eye is interesting, don't you think? With the forward extension of the black pupil, as though for quick focusing, which may account for the capacity of the grayling to rise from the bottom of quite deep water to take a fly floating at the surface. The grayling we've seen so far have been South Country fish, uh, fish off the South Country chalk streams, and grayling vary a great deal from river to river in different parts of the country according to environment. The most essentially typical grayling you can find is found in the North Country. In those Pennine streams that run down through the West Riding of Yorkshire, you find the essence of all that grayling fishing means. Dawn pushes up from the rugged Pennine tops. We're at the River Wharf in the West Riding of Yorkshire. To the tourist, this is an area of the dramatic English novel, with its stone farmhouses, cottages and villages, built among the lonely moors in the north of England. To the naturalist, this is an area of primeval limestone rock, out of which waters have come to form a river that has carved and worn a long winding course through the valleys of the plain. A beautiful river, this, utterly different from southern softness, and to the fishermen, it's classic country for the art of fishing for grayling. At the village of Burnsell arrive Reg Regini and her partners, when they're not salmon fishing further north, fish this Yorkshire River as their home river, and have done so all their lives. For trout, when trout are in season, as they do in spring and summer, but when the trout are done, Reg and Herbert turn to the fine, delicate spot of the grayling. Reg Fragini is a dedicated fly fisherman all the year round. Herbert, in winter, fishes the gilt tail with float tackle. When the water is cold and full, as it is now in depth of winter, then only does Reg reluctantly compromise from the delicate dry fly that is his love to the wet fly. But he still fly fishes, while others, such as Herbert, use the gilt tail to fish down the deeper streams, which is a subtle art as well. And it's a legend in these parts that Reg still takes all his grayling with fly, fish for fish, while others prefer to turn to the float. But however you fish, for them this is a classic river for grayling. Reg and Herbert go separate ways. Herbert about a mile upstream for his worm fishing. Reg to go fly fishing at a place he knows which should be good for fly today. It's over the bridge, a little upstream. The water here has shallow glides among the fast runs. Reading live plentifully in this pool. With wet fly, you cast to let your flies travel downstream with the current, casting well above where the fish should be, because the grayling rise right from the bottom. He's stripping out enough line to cast about six to ten yards from them. The line falls slackly, uh, the flies will go naturally. There's the point fly, a red tag, simulating the action of a live nymph under Reg's careful control. Then the first dropper, an olive nymph, and the bob fly, a fog black. Notice how Reg's left hand, delicately all the time, controls those flies as they fall and are taken down with the current. The flies are never out of touch, as it were, with the rod. This is speculative fishing, exploring every place where grayling should be. A mile or so away, Herbert is fishing in a high gully of rocks known as Loop Scar. He's fishing the worm down the deep pools between the fast-running tumbles of water. The float is made of balsa wood. A piano wire extension below the body cocks the float in the current and takes the worm smoothly and naturally down.
Herbert, feeding the line out at the speed of the current, not to drag the float. The worm's behaviour is as important in its way as the behaviour of those spare mobile flies which Rhett is using in his form of fishing. To watch Rhett Regini, I always think, is a delight to a fellow angler, the, the almost unconscious dexterity with which he feels through the line so that the flies are never out of control. The concentration with which he watches the water for the least sign of fish movement. Uh, these flies don't imitate any specific insect, but rather a suggestion of insect life generally, active, working with the current, responding to every phase of movement of the current, to deceive the fish into thinking that this is food, moving just below the surface. With rage intent on the water, covering every likely piece of water. Hello, a strike. See the typical grayling fight, backing away. It always makes maximum use of the curb. That's his main defence. Ah, he's lost it. It's got off. This happens often with grayling in this kind of water, which enhances the excitement and interest of the fishing. Let's see how Herbert's got to getting on. He's changed his position to fish all the gentler water along the side of the fast-running stream. Trotting his float gently down with the current. Stripping line off, getting it out through the rings of the rod, evenly, just at the pace of the current, it's essential with this trotting of the gilt tail for grayling that the worm shall appear natural. It should just go with the current. Any snatching, any unevenness, means that there will be no bites. It's indeed a, a delicate and precise art of float fishing for grayling, very much a Yorkshire art. There it goes, quite smoothly, evenly to tempt those grayling lying, waiting for food. He bets it back for another trot. The limit of how far he can trot the worm is the limit of how far he can see the float. Maybe 30 or 40 yards, even as much as 70 yards. That's why that float is pretty high on the water. Bait's gone. He puts on another worm, taken out of the bag he carries. These goat tails are kept in damp moss and are fresh and lively. They're tiny worms, but deadly for grayling. Notice the gentle lob of the cast, so that the lightly hooked worm will not be thrown off. It looks so easy, but it can be very defeating to a beginner. There the float goes, right down the streamy run, where Herbert knows there are many grayling waiting between the main currents. See how his little finger is on the edge of the reel as he controls it. He knows the grayling are waiting, probably just in that easement of water beside the main current. There the float goes, just down the side of the main stream, watching, watching carefully, all the time for any sign in that rough water, for there's little indecision about a grayling bite when it does come. And there it is, a, a bite. That peculiar rolling, twisting action is typical of the grayling flight. It tries to get the hook out of its mouth by using all the forces of the current, Although comparatively small, the grayling puts up a terrific fight in these waters. A great deal of skill has to be used, even after it's hooked, to make sure that it's not lost. See how Herbert uses his rod to keep the fish in the slack of water, where it can't make use of the forces against the hook hold. Now he's getting it in. Gently, down with the net and under. 
and here it is, smelling of river mint and wild thyme. And now Herbert has had some success. He knows there'll be a shoal of those grayling there. Yes, indeed, they must be in Retroginius pool, where he's still trying to entice them to that deliberate rise by floating his fly delicately and gently just beneath the surface. There it is. Yes, a rise. Not too hard. It's a delicate hook with a grating backing and riding to make use of the current to get off the hook. And there's Reg using all his skill, playing against the cross currents, trying to get the fish under his control and sort of slack of waters. Giving it line when he thinks it's to his advantage. Taking line when he knows it's safe to do so. Yes, he's bringing it in, but cautiously still, because he's in midstream and he must get the net really underneath before he lifts it. And there it is. Another of the many in this classic railing river, and lovely to eat. Herbert has stopped for lunch, and there's nothing better than the morning's catch. Like this in the open air, utterly delicious, smoked, fresh on the river bank, on a portable methylated spirit stove, with oak shavings. And here comes Reg, also taking time off for lunch with his fishing partner. He contributes his catch and exchanges the morning experiences. And there's no one more reluctant than I to leave them in this North Country Angler's Paradise. That was a delectable day's fishing, and yet, you know, the grayling isn't appreciated everywhere. On the South Country chalk streams, where the trout is highly preserved, rather artificially preserved, the grayling is regarded as vermin because it competes with the trout for food very successfully. But in the North, the grayling is rarely valued, valued as much as the trout, in fact, and I must say I agree with that. Well, goodbye for now. I hope we shall be fishing together again soon. Brown trout, which sometimes is the rainbow trout, you'll find in some of our rivers, is a beautiful fish. Elegantly streamlined, with a neat fine head, beautifully coloured, beautifully spotted. See the little fin on its back in front of the tail? That's the adipose fin, and that shows it's a member of the salmon family. The, the streamlining shows that it's a fish that lives at all levels in the water, as much near the surface as lower, and it also makes possible the fierce, fine activity of it. The trout is a wonderfully fast, furious fighter, a jumper, a maker of long, wild runs.
The trout eats all sorts of things from the bottom, in the weeds, caddis, snails, most of the insects that abound among the plant life. But what I'm concerned with are the flies it eats, under the surface or as they float on the surface. It's because the trout eats flies so consistently that the great sport of fly fishing is possible. Yes, fly fishing's a delicate and meticulous way of fishing. It's done by artificial fly. The techniques of fly fishing have grown up over the centuries by trial and error. To be a successful fly fisherman, you must know at least something of the natural flies which are imitated by the artificial fly. The flies which are mostly imitated are the upwinged or ephemerid flies, and their life cycle starts underwater as an egg, and from this egg hatches the nymph the larva, but the fisherman knows it as a nymph. They rise to the surface and hatch, thus reaching their first stage as a real fly. Fishermen call this fly a dun. After hatching, it floats down the current on the surface, and many are eaten by trout. It's quite a dull-looking little fly with slightly smoky wings. Those not eaten by trout fly away from the water to rest under leaves, on grass stems, and so on. How long they wait depends upon the weather. In warm weather it may be only a few hours, in cold weather a day or so. Then there comes another change. They split again and out comes the final perfect insect, a beautiful little creature with clear glassy wings ready to breed. This the fisherman calls the spinner. Then the female goes upstream, dipping to the surface to lay her eggs, or, according to species, going down into the water to do so. Now she falls, exhausted and dying on the surface, and is what the fisherman knows as a spent spinner. As she floats down, she's eaten by the trout. Now, where to go for fly fishing? Well, the trout is found in a great many rivers, as long as they're pure. But it's dry fly fishing that we're going to do, and that is, briefly, fishing with a fly which floats on the surface. Well, the very finest of dry fly fishing is found on what are known as the chalk streams those clear, pellucid streams that rise under the chalk of the high chalk hills. Many of the loveliest of them are in Hampshire, Wiltshire and Berkshire. This is well up the Kennet in Berkshire, where it's entirely a trout river. See the lovely gliding flow of it. These chalk streams are rich in every sort of life. Their prolific weed growth breeds an equally prolific fly life, and that's why they're so good for dry fly fishing. Flies hatch and float down the surface so regularly that the trout expect them and are ready for them. Of course, at this time of the year, in early April, there isn't a full weed growth yet. I'm waiting here until a hatch starts. When the duns start appearing on the surface, it's what's called a hatch of flies. When the trout begin to take them, it's called a rise of trout. These hatches don't come just at any time. The flies start hatching altogether, and the trout start rising altogether. This rod is made of split cane, and is very lissom, with action going right down it. The rod and line together must make a perfect hole. The rod is a spring, a spring for propelling the fly and the line, which is fat but tapering down to the fly, provides the weight which first sets the spring of the rod and then releases its energy to cast the fly. The wrist action is important. A wrist and forearm should act as one. The wrist mustn't go loose like this. No hatch yet. Well, while we're waiting, I'll show you how the casting is done and the fly is presented. The fly must land and behave as natural flies do, floating like thistle down, entirely naturally with the current. Casting out there, if the line is too taut, 
The different speeds and directions of currents between me and the fly will pull on the, on the line and drag the fly on the surface. That's entirely unnatural and scares the trout. So I must cast with enough line so that I can put snaky curves in the line and when it lands on the water, the curves absorb the pull and the fly itself passes naturally down the surface of the water where the trout is lying in wait beneath. And that's the exciting moment when it passes over where the fish is rising. Still no hatch yet. I'm anticipating that when the hatch does begin, the flies will probably be large dark olives or medium olives. Here's an artificial that will imitate either of those. A gold ribbed hare's ear. Very good fly. Ah, the hatch is just about to begin. There's a fly, a medium olive. Yes, now there are more of them. And there's the first rise of fish. He'll have taken up position now, lying just under the surface, waiting for the flies to float over. Another rise. And another over there. Yes, the rise has started. I'll try that first fish. I approach it as carefully as a cat and downstream, taking care not to show myself. Get up line, false casting until there's enough to drop the fly a few feet upstream of where the fish has risen. The exciting moment. No. The fly has drifted over the fish without a rise. But let the fly go well downstream before retrieving. If I pick the fly off too soon, it'll scare the trout. So I slide it over the surface and off into the air. First false cast to flick wet off the fly. If it becomes waterlogged, it won't float properly. Now we'll see if the fish will take it this time. No, but I still let the fly drift well downstream because sometimes the trout will drop back tail first to the fly before it takes it. No, it's refused it again. No good hammering a fish when you put it down. Much better to leave it for the time being and seek another. Another rise further upstream. I'll go up and try for that one. It's risen again. Just my distance in getting out line. And drop the fly softly just upstream of the fish. Here it comes, over the fish. It's risen. Wait a moment, tighten, and it's on. Strip in line by hand. Must keep in touch with the fish, not give it slack line. That's the first rush over. Take the chance to get some line back on the reel. Ah, there he goes again. Plenty of fight in this fish. Let's take line. Easing again, get some line back.
Off again, but not so far. I can gain a little more line. Lashing now, but tiring, I think. Beginning to come. Get the net ready. No, no, it's off again. It's tiring, yes. He'll soon be in. Now I think he's ready. Hold the net downstream, well sunk in the water. Let the fish drop back, left in their ears. A nice brown trout. Not a big specimen, but at the start of a good day's fishing. Dry fly fishing for trout is wonderful sport. It has that characteristic, which is so true of fishing generally, this utter tranquility, but combined with in such an intensity of excitement. In the case of dry fly fishing, this is particularly in this crucial drift. You cast your fly, it's drifting down, you're waiting to see whether it's, it will be taken or not. Sometimes it isn't. But sometimes there'll be a ring on the water, the fly will have gone, it will have been sucked in and you'll strike. And then there will be the trout fighting fiercely all over the river and you having to use all the skill you've got, all your experience, if it's not to be lost in the weed or in the roots. Of course, dry fly is not the only way of fly fishing for trout, there's wet fly. And there are those who say that it demands more skill than the dry fly. It's a matter of taste. But anyway, I hope we shall show it to you soon. In the meantime, keep your head down and keep a high back line. So, goodbye for now. trout in Britain's northern rivers is very different from the trout of the gentle streams of the south. The difference expresses the differences of the streams themselves. In the north, the water is fast flowing over rocky, rugged beds. Because there's less weed than in the softer chalk streams of the south, there's less creature life bred in these waters for the trout to live on. Life for the trout here is not as rich, not as soft. So the trout are smaller, harder looking, leaner. This trout, the brown trout, is common to all Britain. But this particular brown trout comes from the northern waters. The chalk stream trout can afford to look closely at the fly before it takes it. But not so the rocky river trout. There are the flies don't hatch with the same regularity as they do in the southern streams. And when they do come, they generally sparse her. So the trout has to grab the food while it's there. So different artificial flies are used. This typical chalk stream fly, neatly tied, uh, imitates a fairly close look at the insect it represents. But this Yorkshire fly 
doesn't attempt close imitation. It's sparsely tied with soft, straggly hackles. The play of water on the mobile hackles, just under the surface, uh, conveys an impression of life which attracts. Unlike dry fly fishing, in which only one fly is used, in wet fly you use several, usually three. There's one at the point of the cast, and the others are spaced at yard intervals up the cast on dropper links like this. Uh, the bottom one is known as the uh, point fly, the next one is known as the first dropper, and the second dropper above. Now, where should we go for wet fly fishing for trout? Uh, let's go to the wharf in Yorkshire. This river is very typical of its kind. It rises in the limestone of the Pennines and runs easterly through rugged country, descending very steeply. Streamy runs, fast-running shallow stickles, sometimes gliding pools. We're going to be with Herbert Normington today. He's an expert with the upstream wet fly, a traditional art in Yorkshire and the Northern Counties, and one at which Herbert Normington is very experienced. It's by no means perfect weather for the wet fly, there's quite a breeze, and clouds are causing frequent changes of light as they pass across the sun. Herbert chooses three flies to allow for various contingencies of the most likely ones to hatch. For the tail fly, a little dark watchet. A snipe and yellow for the first dropper, a very typical Yorkshire fly, that. And on the top dropper, a Greenwood's Glory, another very typical Yorkshire fly, which imitates various of the olives. The tackle he is using is the same as for the dry fly, the rod is eight to nine feet, with a tapered line and a cast of probably nine feet. This is thin and difficult water to fish. He wades gently in because disturbances are very easily carried to the trout in very shallow water. With upstream wet fly fishing, you go for those fish that are feeding close to the surface. He's moving carefully upstream to cast ahead of him over the fish as they face into the current. Short, quick casts not more than twice the length of the rod. He lifts his rod at just such a rate that the flies come at the same pace, or very slightly more than the pace of the current, looking all the time for signs where trout are likely to be. If he sees a trout rise, of course, he'll cast over it. But most of this kind of fishing is prospecting, based on judgment and experience, and knowledge of where fish could be. See how the flies behave. They come down just under the surface, the mobile, flexible hackles worked upon by the current, and they move, suggesting life, suggesting the nymph struggling to become a fly. As the flies come back, he raises his rod so as to keep contact with the flies, but not to drag them. It's easier for a fish to hook himself that way. Remember, these are hungry, rough river trout. They have to take their food when it comes. They can't afford to wait to examine an insect closely. That's why these flies suggest action, movement, rather than close resemblance. Now, there should be a fish in that rather smooth stream, smooth compared with the rest of this rough water.
just below those rocks. There in all those little pockets of current, there should be a drought. There must be a drought. And it must be kept in a constant state of expectancy. This is the precise and delicate art of the upstream wet fly, based upon judgment of water, based upon where the fish should be by reading the water. Of course, if there's a rise, it makes the fisherman's life easier. It means that nymphs are rising to the surface. And when the trout sees the nymphs, he goes to take them just as they hatch at the surface. Then there's something more definite to go on. Herbert can cast where he sees the fish actually taking the hatching nymphs. And that's what's happening now. Herbert's casting at rises to tempt the trout to take his fly, a mistake for the real one. There it is. There it is. Yes, it's on. He's hooked it. And there's the fish fighting hard, as all these northern fish do. These rocky river fish are so much better fighters than their south country brothers. Gaining line a little, but get ready to give when it runs. Like that. These rough river trout never give up. And although they're not as heavy, they use the fast water, and to hook them is not necessary to land them. The fish is tiring a little now. Herbert's bringing it in, but there's still lots of life left. Net? No, not yet. Gently in and over with the fish so that it's safely netted. And there it is, a beautiful limestone river trout. There are few sights on earth like these trout freshly from the river, yellow as a buttercup round the girls, round their flanks. Beautiful little wild fish. In this sort of river where you've taken one fish you can expect more. And if you don't disturb the water, you can work upstream, taking a fish here and a fish there, in every little pocket of current. And that's what Herbert Normington is going to do on this spring day as we leave him. That was a lovely day's fishing. Whichever way you fish for trout, it's beautiful fishing. Now, I have with me Dick Bartholomew, who's a dry fly fisherman and was born and bred on the South Country Chalk Stream. Now, I suppose there's no one more convinced of the superiority of the dry fly over the wet than a dry fly fisherman of the Chalk Streams. Uh, now, Dick, do you believe that the dry fly is superior in skill to the wet fly? Bernard, I have no hesitation at all in saying that I think there's just no comparison. The dry fly fisherman has to find his fish, his individual fish, and stalk that fish. He then has to cast his fly within inches and also with a gossamer lightness. But, Dick, uh, won't you allow that wet fly fishing has its skills too? Ah, yes, it has its skills, no doubt. But uh, what does the wet fly fisherman do? He casts his fly somewhere in the water and then he hopes to God that there's a fish there that's going to take it. I'll take you up on that, Dick. 
Now, to be a successful wet fly fisherman, you've got to have a deep knowledge of the water. You've got to be able to read the water. And you've got to be able to judge where fish will be. Ah, yes, but Bernard, that's not so much the actual technique of the fisherman. That is the technique of a naturalist. Yes, indeed it is. Uh, and that, it seems to me, is something in favour of the wet fly fisherman. He has to be something more than just a manipulator of tackle. In a sense, he too fishes to an individual fish. But unlike the dry fly fisherman, he doesn't have the help of seeing the rise or seeing the fish. He has to rely upon his accumulated knowledge to know where the fish is. And that surely demands at least as much skill as that of the dry fly. Well, Bernard, I can't agree with you. And I don't suppose I ever shall. It seems to me that the wet fly fisherman relies far too much on the old chuck it and chance it technique. And that I can't agree with and I don't think I ever shall. Well, there's the typical attitude of the really dedicated dry fly fisherman. Uh, and this argument between the dry fly and the wet fly will continue as long as there is fly fishing. And indeed, all the arguments of fishing will go on endlessly, without ever being resolved. And I, for one, am glad, because there's so much of the fun of fishing in these arguments. Well, let's go fishing together soon. Goodbye for now.